Testing, testing, one, two, three, army, two, four. Okay, guys, we'll begin now. Um, before that, let's get the air, let's get the air clear out. Today would be quite simple. I'll go in depth about the two um, venerables we have in Buddha's um, disciple during Buddha's time. We'll just do a brief one minute chanting meditation together because of time um, I've taken from you guys, sorry. Uh, and then we'll go straight into the story. We'll leave last, say, half an hour just to, you know, reflect about uh, how's, it, how's it going for us, you know, what do you feel like um, so far in your journey, right? In whichever stage of life you're at. Um, or we can reflect about the stories, we can, we can talk about our plan as well, future plans in youth group. So without further ado, we shall begin our session today um, by chanting 10 times Amitofo and meditate for a minute. Amitofo. 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 Okay, so um, have, we, have you guys remember what we talked about last time? Or well, Maggie was here last week, but um, other than that, other than Maggie, anyone else remember what we talked about last time? Anything that you bring home with the session last time? No. It's okay. Maha mm. Kasyapa. Ananda? Heaven. Mujenye, uh, Mogadalayana. That's a very lengthy name. But um, yeah, Mogadalayana, Shariputra, uh, Maha Kasyapa, and actually we're going to Suputi. We're going to wrap up Suputi properly. Um, Suputi and Shiputi and uh, today we'll talk about Purna. So these are the first five disciples we have introduced in the classics. So what we're trying to do here is just to get something out of this session where, you know, why are they the top disciples of the Buddha? And why are they so successful in their, um, you know, in their cultivation? Just as we have our role model in our, in our life, like whoever is successful in the line of work we're in, you know, work hard, working, wise, quick to adapt. So same goes for cultivation. It's an organization of people and you have a group of people, then you 
naturally will see everyone extending their um, strength in different fields, right? And you see how well they utilize you know, that part of skills to service the sentient beings through their organization. So in Sangha, this is no exception. Everyone has their own, how to say, um, strength and weaknesses. And how they do it is how they use that part that speaks to them, that resonates to them, and use it in their duty, in their career. This is their career, right? Of course, this case is, um, is a service to the sentient beings. But before service to the sentient beings, you realize each of them have, how to say, a very strong connection to the Dharma, strong connection to the um, enlightenment, uh, to the path of enlightenment. They really want to, um, how to say, accomplish something before they do it. They, they really have a vision of what they are going to be. Not really clear, Buddha will clarify it for them, but they already kind of figure out what is it they want before they went into the Sangha properly. Um, you can see these top 10 disciples are like that. Even when they're born in a rich family, most of them are in rich families. Um, and, you know, they have well loved, well cared. Even, you know, like Mahakashyapa's case, he was, um, his parents say, you have to marry. And then his wife happens to be having the same goal as him, want to be a monk and nun. So they're also being very filial to their parents. They wait for 12 years together. So even though they are husband and wife in name, they never commit any, uh, consume the uh, marriage, you know, consummate the marriage. So this is why, how to say, this is why it's very important to have a right direction first. You know what you want, what you're seeking for, and then you kind of fill in the blanks like, oh, this is how I do it. Oh, this is the teachers that will give me the skills and knowledge to do that. And then eventually as you walk down the path, your direction gets clearer and you see yourself more and more into that person that you want to be or that state you want to be. So today we'll talk about Suputi and Purna. Suputi is very well known for um, his emptiness, understand, not understanding, he's aware of emptiness. He's, um, how to say, foremost in realizing the truth of the world, which can be summarized in one word, sunyata, emptiness. And emptiness is um, always a mistaken concept by a lot of people because how, how to say, people might color, uh, um, how to say, might paint a picture of bleak, nihilistic, you know, uh, life has no meaning, that kind of mindset to it. Whereas Buddhism emptiness is full of life, right? Buddhism's emptiness, kong, sida jie kong, se ji kong, kong ji se, this kong, this emptiness, this sunyata, is full of life. Look at this universe, right? It's so empty, desolate, and void, yet we're here, full of activities outside. So emptiness and life, which we call being, so emptiness is unbeing, being, if we put it that way, if there's no one, it's emptiness. If someone is being, it sounds like a opposite concept, but Buddhism's emptiness is not opposite concept. Emptiness allows life to flourish, right? Without emptiness, there is no, there's no change. There's no dynamics. And without any dynamics, we shouldn't be here at all. What's the point? We, we don't even, we can't even achieve anything. Why are we spending two hours here talking about this then, right? Because of emptiness, we're here, understand the nature of the reality, and then change it to our liking. That's, that's what a Buddha should do. Jing Sui Xing Zhuan. Right? If you can change the environment, that around you, right? Either mentally, physically, you are Buddha, right? And that's why Buddhism is so valuable. Not because it's just about spirituality, meditation, yoga, or whatever. It's actually more about how you find yourself, find back yourself in the path that you understand, that the path you can walk on. There's no one fixed path, but there's only one truth. There's so many paths you take, there's so many journey you have to go through. Some people take longer. Some people does not need that long. Some people, yeah, some people might go in backwards, but then eventually they have to find that place they call home in their heart. So it's very 
it's a very powerful um, realization and wealth you have if you understand this. This is your wealth. This is your power. This is your destiny that you make yourself. However, this is the how to say this is the broad stroke of things. To get there is a journey. Like when you saw a drama or saw a movie, you saw that from a God's point of view. You've seen everything. You know their story. You know their motivation. But when you're that character inside that movie and drama, you don't know what's happening in front of you. You have your own story, but no one knows you. Maybe people know you, they know half of the story. The other half, they don't understand. All right? And then it takes such a long and there's a little silence in between to meet someone who actually understands you. All right? For all these disciples, they met Buddha, who understand him. Also, they met each other, you know, like um, Shariputra and Mogadalayana, they are best friends. All right? They have this more um, Mahakashyapa and his, 12, his wife for 12 years um, also knows him. All right? So this is very rare to have someone who knows you. Most of the time it's lonely, it's silence, it's patience, it's, 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 you have to tolerate yourself, you have to you have to pull yourself up. You have to use the Dharma to help yourself if you have the chance to encounter it. So Sunyata is a powerful concept to help you navigating this. Because Sunyata allows you to have space in your heart, right? To empty out, to allow most more important stuff to come in. First of all, you need to know what is important stuff. First of all, you need to know what really speaks to your heart. And first of all, you need to find yourself back first before you understand what you want to get from the outside. A lot of us go outside seeking things that we think we need, but after all this effort spending on seeking it, it's not what we want. Um, and it, nothing's wrong with that because we have not fully enlightened yet. We have not fully aware yet. That's part of the process. Loss is part of the process of being found. Um, so that's the beauty of it. And Venerable Subhuti has beautifully mastered this uh, understanding, not just mentally, intellectually, but he lived the reality of it. So how he lived of it, and Buddha praised him for that. First, he was born in a wealthy family, of course. Right, everyone's prince and, you know, at least very wealthy. But his um, action immediately is give away the wealth, right? So that is his actual action when he's conscious. When he was born, it was said that all the wealth in his family, which is like a trading empire, disappear for seven days. So it is a sign that this sage is coming down here to talk about the nature of emptiness. You know, all this wealth that accumulate over time, right? The nature of it is empty. That means it's always changing. It's dynamic. It's not permanent. If you say it's there, it's this, that means it's always this. It cannot change. But look at us. We grow up. We will age. We will pass. We always changing, right? Dylan's from six seventeen is not the same Dylan as twenty seven. So this this is this is a very mundane concept, but a lot of people somehow um, because they are too focused on their life, they forgot sometimes that you know this is how it should be, rather than I mean this is how it is. It is what it is. Instead of um, you know implying their thought on top of it, which is wandering thought. And hence, they could not alter the reality because they do not know the laws of it. They do not understand, you know, karma. They do not understand. Um, uh, in order to change the outside world, we need to find ourselves first in the inside. What is that source of creation? Who creates this thing? Pain, love, sufferings, and pleasure, um, you know, yearning, um, uh, hating or annoyed, all these emotions, all these myriads of changing um, circumstances in our heart and outside the world as well. It has laws governing it. So we need to understand that. Before that, um, Venerable, back to Sup Venerable Suputi, he, of course, um, very, very wise. Apologies, oh, that? it's too dark. We need some light. Yeah, there we go. Enlightenment. That's right, enlightenment, light. <sighs> but you know, without darkness, we don't appreciate the light, right? Um, some people stuck in the dark can never get out of it. But um, if you can help it, always, when you see a, a hint of light, grab onto it and do it, take it. 
um, it's always important. Um, opportunity always appear in your life. So for Suputi, his opportunity comes in not by accident. He has prepared himself. Since young, his parents was like nagging him. Why do you give away all your wealth? Why do you give all this away? You know, you have all the wealth in the world. Why do you give it away? This is your parents' money. It's like, I saw them impoverished. So I helped them. You know, they need it more than I do. So I helped them. His mind is simple, pure, kind. And after that, he's very smart. He learned the Vedic, which is the common curriculum of the time. Basically, he mastered all the knowledge of the world at the time, just like Buddha. He picked up very fast. He understand the philosophies of it. He become, you know, one of the very well-learned individuals. However, he say, after he read the Vedic, he say, only the sage understand my heart, understand my um, motivation, because he gives away the wealth in contrast to um, a lot of people that, you know, trying to accumulate it, trying to keep it, trying to hoard it, um, trying to build up fame and power and prestige. He give it all away. So he's like, only sage can know me. And then his parents actually uh, take refuge in the Buddha. And then he kind of like advised by his parents, like, um, you should go to meet, you should meet this sage, right, in uh, Lumbini, um, in Kapilavat, from Kapilavatsu. Um, probably will solve your problem. So he actually met the Buddha and yeah, he become his monk, his students. One of the most famous um, ex, uh, story about him or uh, not involved with him, about from him is the stories of, in Chinese it's called Geli Wang, right? In, in Sanskrit it's Kalingaraya, Kalinga Raja. So the King Kalinga, so to speak. The King Kalinga is a cruel king. In Buddha's past life, he was practicing tolerance. In Chinese, we call it Renru, Renru Xian Ren. So he's practicing tolerance. And in his practice of tolerance, he was sitting under a tree and meditate. Happened to have the King Kalinga around with his entourage of concubines, of you know, uh, ladies and all that. And then he was resting under the tree. The concubines was you know, walking around and exploring the forest. And he met Buddha's past life, ascetic an ascetic sitting under the tree peacefully and ser uh, in serene composure. So they were very drawn by this rare sight. You know, they were like, um, Mr. Why are you sitting here so peaceful and quietly? He say, my heart has no hatred. My heart has no um, desires. My heart is as peaceful as, um, you know, the, the surface of the lake. I have no um, qualms of anything with the world. I'm practicing tolerance. So um, the king woke up and saw his ladies, his woman, just, you know, surrounding another man. So being a worldly man he is, he used a worldly sight to see this. And he woke up to the ascetic with that um, jealousy and anger. So because everyone was listening to him talking about tolerance, talking about Dharma. But of course, being a very bad tempered person he is, you know, he woke up to him and said, what are you doing? I'm practicing um, meditation. What are you meditating on? On how to achieve tolerance, how to attain paramita of tolerance, rendu poromi, how to attain the highest level of tolerance. So he's being very literal. He's like, if you want tolerance, I'll teach you what is tolerance. So he literally draw out the sword and lop off his left ear. And then is that painful? He's like, do you feel hate now? It's like, no, I have no hate. I have no, um, uh, I was like, I don't feel any hate towards you, sir. And then he lopped off another ear. What about now? The, um, how to say, the sage was like, I do not give rise to any hatred. He repeated it again. In fact, the ascetic was actually invited by his court officials, the king's court officials to the court. He was just resting there, happened to be around the, um, the forest near the, the royal palace. So the official ran up to him and said, you should stop. This is actually a sage. You know, I actually invited him. So being, you know, a very cruel king he is, he continued and locked off his limp and said that would, same thing. Like, you know, do you feel the parliament of tolerance right now? Basically provoking in a sense. And um, being a attained sage as he is, he remained unmoved. He remained settled. And then he was like, um, I have no hate towards any sentient beings, you know. Uh, I have no, um, how to say, 
resentment towards anyone who did that to me. And hence, his blood, he also kicked by the king until his blood gushes forward out because it was kicked into the lung. And yet he remained, uh, how to say, unmoved. He remained un, you know, he doesn't have a reaction of anger in him. It was until then the king stops his action, right? And there is another version where he actually cuts him bits by bits until he literally is left with bones and stuff. So, of course, his body was undergo this immense torture. But him being a sage, he has attained it. And what helps him going through this immense torture, right? We saw the movie, you know, maybe one of those war movies and people like torturing each other or like Holocaust and all this. We've seen that it's um, disgusting. It's, it's full of disgust. It's full of resentment on this action. But Buddha went through all this as well. And how he attained this is something we need to learn. Right? We can't just hear the story and say, okay, he's a sage. I'm a, I'm a ordinary being. I'm going to punch that king. Right? But the rest of other, uh, he's just Buddha. So he's sitting there, but I'm just going to behave as I would. No. Then we learn nothing from his action. So why is Suputi's story involving King Kalinga? Why did they chronicle in under his name? Right? Instead of just a generic, Buddha has attained tolerance because Buddha is perfect. That means he has attained all qualities. And Suputi is representing Sunyata. Sunyata means emptiness. And the Buddha thought after that story, he gave that moral of the story, right? To the, to the Susuputi. True Suputi talking to us. He says that he vowed that he has no hate, that in the very last breath, he vowed that he has no hate, his limb and ears will grow back. Okay, so after being cut down, down to his torso or whatever, left of his body, he walked, he looked at the King Kalinga and said, if I am who has no hatred, who has no resentment towards anyone, even just a little bit, all right? If I am pure from this hate, I shall have my limbs and all the parts of my body grow back. Immediately, it grew back. So it's, it looks like a magical scene, which it is. It is magical, right? And of course, King Kalinka walks away then. Of course, you know that this is a sage. It's not a normal people. And in other, in, in, to add on top of it from what I learned in the Mahayana Chinese sources is what they also translate this part of the story. On top of it, this is the past life of his first Buddha disciple, Chao Chen Ru. I haven't translated the, the uh, read the Sanskrit part of it, but basically he has not just vowed not to hate, he also vowed to save this person that con afflicting this level of torture on him. I vow to save you. Uh, I when I become Buddha, perfected all qualities, all right, of, of virtues, I will, you will be my first student. Chao Chen Ru, right? Yeah. And um, this Chao Chen Ru, you know, first disciple in the Lumbini Garden, Lumbini Garden, Lu Wei, Lu Ye Yuan, the Bamboo Groove Garden, is him, King Kalinga. So King Kalinga, by cutting off the limb of a sages, he has planted the seeds of enlightenment. Don't mistaken it though, he might have to suffer a lot of. I would say he will suffer a lot of cycles of hell and all that. But when he get back to the normal, normal level, human level, he get to meet Buddha. But also remember, the more of the story is he do not resent, right? And then how he not resent is very important for us. It's a recipe. Because first he advised everyone, do not resent as if we only create um, obstacle for ourselves, right? When you get angry, you mess up your temple. You know, your words get like frothed up. You can't say anything properly. You can't think properly. You are full of heat in your head. And then your impulse is to do anything violence or say anything violence towards them. And that will obstruct you even further from achieving your goal, trying to communicate or trying to get point across or trying to get something accomplished. Because you're angry because someone's in your way or you're angry because someone does not go your way. And un not understanding, um, being blinded by anger uh, is the is another way. I mean, it's adding on top of the obstacle that you're already facing. 
So his recipe is sunyata. So that's why it's under Suputi's chronicle. Because he talks to Suputi and say that the, when I was being cut off piece by piece like that, I was in this state of no self. Well, I was, was in this state of um, no person. I did not see any person. I did not see a notion of self. I do not see the concept of person. I do not see a concept of beings. And I do not see a concept of life. So in Chinese word, very famous. So this is one of the famous um, phrase used in Zen Buddhism, especially when they attained enlightenment. People who attain enlightenment, the way they see the world or the way they not see the world, right, is they do not attach to self. They do not attach to there's people. They do not attach to there's being. So there's no you and I. There's no like conf uh, like you opposite of I, right? When I say something, it's always in duality. Something means opposite of nothing, right? I means opposite of you, um, up opposite of down, etc. Buddha opposite of sentient beings. So when Buddha says he's in that state, that means he does not have all these conflicting stances. He's fluid. He's everywhere. Uh, so Buddha in the past has attained this, and thanks to him, he were able to see past the atrocities and attain enlightenment by perfecting his um, quality of tolerance. He able to be tolerated. He able to let go of his body. Because there's no I, that means no matter who you hurt or what you hurt, right? it's not me. You're not hurting me because me is not in this body. Me is not this body. Me is just using this body. Who is me then? Emptiness. Yeah. What is what is emptiness? Emptiness. Sounds like a movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, that's that's the concept. Everything everywhere at once, right? Yeah. That's a, that's that's the concept. I think, like, like I said, Buddhism can be found everywhere in the world. It doesn't have to be purely in the sutra. If you understand the principle and laws of the karma and dharma, you can use it everywhere, even when you're having entertainment from a show. Um, but yeah, like, like a lot of this question was asked during you know, the prime of the Zen Buddhism. They were like, who, who are you? Who is the face of you before you um, were born? Who are you before you were born? You know, Fumo Wei Zen Zen Bun, I mean, so all these are very um, reflective kind of um, exercise. It's an exercise. Understanding Sunyata will give you all this freedom. He's free. He's free. He's free to actually attain what he wants. In the very beginning, he's trying to learn practice of tolerance. And he's already practiced to a level where he does not attach to his body feeling. Now he can perfect it by understanding being inflicted. The one that was the victim is there is no victim because there's no I, there's no you who is the perpetrator. There's no I who is the victim, right? There's no this action of inflicting violence on me. So I do not think of this as something that happened, right? Same goes for giving, parameter of giving. There's no you that receive, there's no I that give, there's no this matter of charity that happened. All right? I just purely act on it out of my um, pure heart. I just want to help you. That's it. I don't want to label anything on top. Oh, this artist has done so much thing. This uh, wealthy man is very kind. I don't label myself as kind. All right? I am like that because this is the right thing to do. This is, after, this is my, from my own heart to you. I want to help you. So this is love. This is compassion. Um, and yeah, he don't even attach. I'm compassionate as well. So always remember, um, do not get tied down by your labels, by your name. Just get reminded by your name, like Shyamuni Buddha remind, his name remind himself to be uh, patient, to be um, compassionate, you know, to be wise and compassionate. So that's it for Suputi in general. His story is not too long, uh, but he's always in his primary mention in uh, uh, Jin Gang Jin, uh, Diamond, Diamond Sutra. 
Um, because this sutra talks about emptiness. This sutra is the uh, representing sutra of Zen Buddhism. And Zen Buddhism, like what Master Ching Pong has said, there's three doors. Like Renumbo Cheng, the rephrasing what Master Ching Pong, when Master Ching Pong rephrasing what the sages have said. Um, there's three doors to walk into the city of enlightenment. Door number one is the most direct one, which is what the Zen Buddhism is trying to do. Chan Zong trying to do is um, emptiness, is wisdom. You know? uh, and then middle door is a longer route. It means right understanding. The last one is purity, pure of mind, pure of, devoid of any desires, devoid of any, how do I say, wandering thoughts. The desire is only attached to, in our pure land context, attached to going to pure land. So you're allowing only one desire left, which is going to pure land. The desire intensity has to be at least as strong as what you desire in the world. So I desire wealth, I desire woman, I desire uh, fame, I desire influence, power. You have to use that desire and then swap it with desire to the pure land. So it's not, it's easy because it speaks to us. We desire something. When we desire something, you go ahead and do it. You, or you plan your plot trying to get there. So if you can practice to a level where you swap the object of your desire from whatever is in the world, the five desires, into pure land, then you made it in this path. Because you purify everything, nothing left except Amitofo. That's the goal in the third door. Second door usually is um, reading the sutra. Mm -hmm. Chanting the sutra, repeating the sutra, every single day you immerse in the sutra. And then you, how to say, best representative is consciousness only school. A lot of, a lot of terms. A lot of terminologies, a lot of uh, understanding, very logical, step by step. You know, when you have eight consciousness, uh, it's because it has been twisted from the original Buddha nature. You know, eight consciousness, you have five senses. After five senses, your six senses is your thought that processes the information. The seventh, mona, monas, is the one that attached to what it was analyzed. I attached to this color. I attached to this person. I attached to this notion, concept. The eighth consciousness is the hard disk drive that stores every single thing in it and it boxes it up, right? Your past life is boxed up into the archive. Now your present life was cleared up for present life information. And then sometimes you met some encounterment and then your past life just pops up. And then you're like, oh, I like this person. Oh, I don't like this person. So this is your, this is how it works. I oversimplify it. So the Master Shinkon used that a lot as well in his teaching. He used a lot of terminologies from the consciousness on his school. So pick one. Pick one that speaks to you, that helps you to attain um, the goal. As long as you reach the objective, that's all that matters. Um, however, be aware there are always, there are different paths, right? Because I'm not only, I'm not only speaking to pure land practitioners, I also want to speak to the, the world as well. In that sense, for pure land practitioners, we also need to understand why are we picking this in the first place, why are we doing pure land practice instead of so many others interesting path? And remember, ultimately they're equal. They came from Buddha's nature, which is Buddha's um, teaching. Buddha's teaching came from his Buddha nature. He don't process it with too much thoughts. It just came out when was asked. And among all the teachings, pure land school is the one that was not asked. He just give it out to you. He just say, here, Chan Amitabha. Of course, there are time where um, one of the queen of the kingdom, king, uh, Indian kingdom back then, his son was avenging his father. I mean, his son was rebellious against his father and in the end caused his father to starve to death in the jail because he usurped his father's throne. And the lady was the queen, his mother, right? His own son was rebelling against his husband and she was trapped in that, um, trapped in the um, jail. And one of the sages, I think it's Ananda, or I forgot, one of the sages uh, visited him and say, okay, I will pass down your words to Buddha. She asked, is there a place where there is no such ridiculous thing happen? You know, your own son rebel against your, yourself or where killing, where betrayal does not happen. She has been through so much. 
And she just prayed that I can go a place where I'm free of all this pain and suffering and torture. So she talked to the venerable and venerable went back to the Buddha. And the Buddha says, I, I, I will go to her tonight. The God will not notice because he used his miraculous power. So in the night time, she, um, she was told by the venerable to look at the window and pray. His name, Namo Sayamuni Buddha, Namo Sayamuni Buddha. So he appears and then talk to him about what do you wish for, um, lady, whatever the name is. And then the lady was, the queen was like, is that a place I can escape from all this, you know, betrayers and deceit, deceive is I'm pure land, I'm pure world, so much hatred, so much plotting. And then he's like, okay, so I give you all this tour to the Sanchin Dashen Sujie. I give you the tour of all the Buddha's land. All right, you pick one. See, he didn't say go here, go there. He's like, this is the world of uh, Buddha, you know, medicine. This is the world of Buddha A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the virtues and merits. And then he, she went through all the world, including his own, and then um, end up in Pure Land, Amitabha Buddha. He's like, oh, I like this place. Yeah, I like this. Can I go there? Basically, Buddha Shaimuni is a tour guide. He's like, this is A, this is B, this is exhibit C. Which one would you like to go? Uh, I want that one. I want, I want, I want uh, the world where the Buddha Amitabha resides. So he picked, she picked it. After thousands of, because time is, remember, time is relative, right? Einstein, yay. Um, so maybe they're only like one minute in the real, in the human timeline, but they've already been to like many worlds, eons and eons. So Buddha was like, okay, you make your decision, pure land. Now, let me teach you how to do pure land. No, they did not teach directly chanting. For her, very correct at that time. She was trapped in the jail. Right, can imagine such a long, arduous time. Her husband just passed away not long ago. So she looks at the window and look at the sunset and sunrise and sunfalls. So Buddha used that and created one of the Pure Land classics called Guan Wu Liang Shou Jing. So how do you observe um, Amitabha Buddha? You know, you start with the sun. You know, you start with the sunrise. You know, you start with the notion of sunrise. You start with that and then you start with the light coming out and then you zoom out. It's like a movie, you zoom out and you saw that Buddha's face. And then you don't just saw Buddha's face. What is Buddha's face? The eyebrow, the eyes, you know, the compassionate eyes, the nose, everything, very detailed. It's like the artist drawing a picture and then focus very intense until you observe the entirety of the Amitabha Buddha. You know, that yearning, that, 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 image was projecting so strong on that one, you go to Pure Land. So it's such a long-winded route for her because it's right for her. So for us, it has, there are four methods, right? The first one is the way the Zen uh, people gain enlightenment, right? They chain enlightenment by understanding Sunyata, what Subhuti did, right? There is no notion of self, there's no notion of uh, person, there's no notion of being, there's no notion of life. So you can go straight into what Amitabha Buddha means, you know, emptiness. But for us, it's a concept. It's not a reality. We can't, we haven't, we need a lot of time to get there. So we need help. So this is one of the methods. Our method is Siminyanfo, which is chanting Amitabha Buddha by his name. The reason is, this is also what I heard when I started in Pure Land uh, School is, because the one that was introduced to the queen was very long, very, it takes 24 hours. You need to look at the Buddha statue every day. You need to have the time, the fortune of not going to work, not worrying about the, you know, the assignments and all that in uni. You need to literally just pray, look at Amitabha Buddha's image, Im visualize it according to the 16 steps. There are 16 steps of visualizing Amitabha Buddha. And then you have to keep that image intact, not blurry. It cannot be blurry. It has to be 1080p, right? It cannot be 480p. It has to be clear. If you're very good, 1440p, right? 4K resolution. It has to be high resolution until it's so strong, then you get there, okay? And the problem is once you get there, why am I doing like sales in a moment? Okay. When you get there, right, the image stuck 
in your head. Problem is, in pure land, when you get there, you need to unstuck yourself from the image. So it's a tool that sticks with you a bit longer than Amitabha Buddha's name. You need to literally unstuck the image of Amitabha Buddha. Because remember, sunyata, emptiness, right? You only use this as a vessel to get to pure land. Once you get to pure land, you should not be stuck with the image of the Buddha. You should, what the sutras say, literally listen to the Dharma, go across the entire world, many, many world, many universe to offer your whatever you have, the best thing you have to the Buddha of the other world to accumulate your fortune, wisdom and fortune. And you need to unstuck yourself. So they, they will take a bit longer to unstuck the image in their mind. That means they need to, just like you like your music, right? It keeps sticking in the head. And then after one or two years, you've gone through many things and you forgot. So yeah, speak from experience. Anyway, um, yeah. So unstuck image is so hard. And then the third one, I, uh, I forgot. I think. So, so last one is, I, I forgot the third one, the last one is the easiest. It's the most um, convenient. Ami Tofu. Just four words. Not even Namo. If you're going there to his land, become one of his students, don't be like, oh, nice to meet you, sir, or Mr. You just go straight and call the name, right? Like Ami Tofu. It's like your own father. You don't call your father Mr. Full Name, right? That's a bit weird. You just go straight and say, Dad, can I have money? Dad, can I have food? You know? Basically, yeah, like, Dad, can I get out of here? Right? Um, basically, you chant his name just like you chant the name of your dad. Dad, help me. Mom, help me. I, I'm stuck. Of course, with respect and, and love, but close, very intimate, very close. So that's, that's the concept. And then when you get there, it's easy to unstuck the name in your head because you literally need to just immerse into the environment he gives you, you know, the audiovisual environment, 4D, 5D, 8D, whatever. And that, that gives you the full immersion of the Dharma. You, you hear the birds chanting Dharma, you hear the trees chanting Dharma, not in a dry way like I did, in a very soothing way, like music. Like he did give a proper talk in the main hall. You sit there and listen to the talk but you are not stuck there like, like now you're stuck here, right? You can go everywhere while you listen to the talk without losing concentration. So that's the best part of it. I went a bit off, but sunyata is important because this cannot happen without sunyata. Without sunyata, everyone's stuck. You're forever like this. But look at us. We are not forever 18. We're not forever stuck in that, right? It's also a torture. What if you have this trouble, sad, tragedy part of your life? Are you, do you want to get stuck there forever? No. A lot of people can get out. I, I, I won't dare to say I'm not a doctor, but a lot of people get stuck in that scenery and unable to help themselves. And then that affects that part of our life that they should have progressed to that stage, but they're still stuck back in that childhood or whatever. And that impedes them from moving forwards. And the, the, the reason is so complicated. Right, I'm being psychology I've studied that. Even Buddha talks about the karma of it. It's so complicated. Not so complicated. They they explain the karma, past life. This person did this to them. To solve the problem, of, you need someone of that caliber to tell you straight away. In his mind, there is this encounter that stops him in this life to perform well, or to stop having phobia on this one. Right, this is the Buddhist way of looking at it, three lives more than three lives. So it's a very, how to say, attachment is a very strong thing. It takes a lot of time. That's why Buddha, first time when you went into his door, become his monk or his lay disciple, he teach you about, yes, all the moral and virtues, karma. But in the end of the day, you need to start with, if you really want to be his student, that is, you at least attain one enlightenment stage. You need to have sunyata. So, he, so he's very famous for that. So what time? Are we doing well in the time? So we're going to stop at 12, right? Um, Purna. Purna's story is beautiful. It's, it's very relatable because we came here because of Master Ching Kong's example. And um, Purna, in very brief way of saying, he's foremost in preaching. He preaches so well. He preaches beautifully. Um, 
and his full name is Purnama Hayani Putra, Boundless Preaching and Compassion. I think our Master Ching Kong has emulated very well the quality of Venerable Purna. Right? He is represented in our era, our Purna, in this generation. All right. Shortly speaking, he attained out of hunt right after he get, become a monk. So in, without taking a lot of days, just like Salifo, Shariputra, he attained enlightenment one or two days. It's like someone just enrolled in year one and they already got doctor degree straight away. So this is um, amazing. And he's wealthy as usual, born and wealthy, full of love, full of care, but he has understanding of sunyata. He let it go. He says it's temporarily. It does not last forever, and he takes refuge in Buddha. And immediately he knows what he wants. He says that the one I want to do in this organization is to spread these good things I learned from Buddha, Dharma, to the world. Because so many people need it. So he has a missionary ethos. He has that heart of compassion. He had to be compassionate enough to go through all that trouble of repeating again and again and again to all sorts of people. All right, and you have to accommodate them. You have to follow their pace. You have to understand the culture. You have to literally feed them as well, teach them everything, to to so that they can settle down and listen to the Dhamma. That's what he did. Uh, Buddha has prophesied that he will become Buddha very soon. He will become Buddha, and his Buddha title, like Shaimuni Buddha, his title is Dhamma Paras Prapsa, Dhamma P R A B H A S A Prapsa. That means he is. I, I don't dare to misunderstand it in Chinese, but Zheng Fa, Zheng Fa Yan, yes. basically illuminator of the law, such a cool name. Buddha illuminator of the law, Dhamma law, Kama law. So everyone was shocked. He just attained Arahan. He hasn't attained the Bodhisattva hood. How can he become Buddha? So straightforward. And Buddha say, do not jump to conclusion. He's good in preaching. And he's not just preaching this life. He's been preaching for many, many lives. So this is not a new person trying his hand on Dharma teaching, his experience. Just like Manjushri being teacher for seven life of all the Buddha. Chief Otsusu, Wen Su Sri Pusa. So Manjushri uh, Bodhisattva has done that a lot of times. So what emulates him as a best in preaching, right? Spread the Dharma. So you look at Master Ching Kong and then went back to this, you'd be like, oh, real life Purna. I mean the Purna in our era. First, he saw everyone was very defeated. His fellow bhikshu, fellow monk was like, oh, nothing gets done properly. All right. I, um, I, always, I keep failing. Uh, we, we fail in preaching. All right. They all sat in silence and say, just enjoy our solitude. And then he walks up to them and say, what's going on, um, bhikshus? What's going on? Everyone give a seat to him. And then he's like, tell me what happened. And then all the bhikshu was like, we try. We really try, sir. We try to go all across the religion, all the places. We're trying to preach the Dharma, you know, the sunyata emptiness, the four noble truths, you know, how to cultivate um, emptiness and also attain enlightenment. Uh, but to do that, they need to get out of five desires. Wealth, food, sleep, sexual drive, and, and faith the five common desires of the world. They are all too immersed in it, said the big Uh I could not get them out of it. I could not pull them out of it. They're so deep immersed into it. And what's worse, they kill animals to make sacrifice. Ah, that is so familiar. Still happening nowadays. They kill animals to make sacrifice, right? The big suits try, we all try, but they ignore our advice, right? The, the, the act of no killing, right? The karma. So Purna was like, this is always tough, right? But remember what, to, to repay our gratitude to Buddha is why we're doing this here. We're here because of Buddha. We attain this result, enlightenment, success because of Buddha. And to repay him, we need to make sure that we benefit, what we benefited, we benefit the others. That's his wish. And his wish is my wish. And that's how student he's so good at. He's understand what his teacher wish aligns with what he wish, and he want to push it out and share with others. Remember, these are difficult things. We're not saying it's easy, but we should always have the heart of overcoming the difficulties 
because there's a very, very simple motive. I just want to say thank you to my teacher. To thank him, I'll do what he wishes for. All right? And what he wishes for is what I wishes for as well. Otherwise, I won't follow him. Right? What I wishes for is to get that warmth and care and love from the Dharma and spread the love and warmth of the Dharma to the world because everyone was living in their own poverty. Their poverty in some aspect. Hence, imperfection. Buddha is perfection of everything. If you're perfect in everything, you're not impoverished, you're abundant. But sentient beings are impoverished. They can be wealth, which is most superficial and quick way to understand that word, but they're also impoverished in mind. You know, do not know what to do. Very blank. Or impoverished in spiritual, spiritual heart. They are desires, they are all wealth and intelligence. They all focus on purchasing the outside. They forgot they need to import, uh, nourish the inside. They forgot how to be a good son, how to be a good husband, how to be a good human. They forgot what is being a human like. You know, they all, they can act all, all good in all that career and all that social settings, you know, all the phase and all the stuff, but they do not know what the heart is. They live all this life poorly. They drive Ferrari poorly. They become powerful poorly. So this is why Dharma is needed. She tell them all this, right? Sentient beings, it's like beggars. Well, that sounds wrong. Sentient beings are, um, like I say, have always some aspect lacking. And they are like the beggars yearning for wealth, yearning for food, for shelter. We should always keep that Dharma in mind and share it whenever we can so that they are having the wealth of Dharma. They no longer be poor. They no longer be impoverished. They always be happy, which is fulfilled. This is our job as the preacher. So he has the right mindset on, on a goal. She has a very strong sense of mission, strong sense of goal. And his attitude in preaching is, his attitude is important as well. He always attribute the the, the merits to the Buddha. All his credits and praises he attribute to Buddha, not himself. So he does not attach to himself. He's like, it's Buddha's help. Every time I start preaching, I always pray to his name. Nam Sawamuni Buddha, Nam Sawamuni Buddha. I pray for his help. I pray for his help that he gives me that wisdom, gives me that kindness, compassion, patience to, to spread the teachings. Um, Buddha frequently, he also frequently meditation and do not eat a lot. Everyone was like, how do you do that? Um, Venerable Puna. And he said, I always think about how many hardship Buddha has to face. Because remember, Buddha has shared all his story about his past life or his, you know, his, how, how hard he went through to get enlightenment. He starved himself for six years, right? He went through all the places by foot without any help just to get the knowledge. And he realized the knowledge is not useful. And then he just go under the trees and meditate for six years without eating. And then he get enlightenment. Also his past life, getting cut by King Kalinga, etc., etc., feeding his body to the tigers, very famous. Um, went through all this, right? So he think of how hard is it for Buddha to reach where he is. And he give it all just like that. He give all his wisdom just like that. Now he's not trying to sell, trying to promote market or anything. He's just give it away. So, what is my suffering compared to his suffering, right? What is all this compared to what he has to go through? He has gone through all this, set up this system for us, you know? So why are we not grateful? So, and is there any reason for me not to push forward? No. So he pushed forward because he's grateful. And he always think of this, how compassionate he is. He wants to do the same. So, he would not just talk about it, he realized it in a place called Sudana. Sudana is in our real life, like Somali, or places very devoid of human warmth. I'm not saying that there's no human living there. It's human all living there, but they're all almost trying to kill each other. Or it's a very rude place, it's very hard to deal. It's a very dangerous place in the sense of people are not, there's no law and order in a sense. And one of the biggest reasons is they're impoverished. They don't have enough food, they don't have enough medical facilities, right? medical knowledge. So impoverished in all forms. 
Buddha has also like in the gathering and say, Oh, Venerable Puna, this is very dangerous places. Are you sure you want to go there? And then he asked him, give a test to him. What if you're injured? As long as they do not use knife towards me, I can take it. What if you're stabbed? As long as I have medicine, I can take it. What if you're killed? Well, then I repay my gratitude to you, to everyone. So be it. He has also attained light to me, by the way. Um, not, not yet, but he's, he has that vow. Like, I do not dare to die. I don't, I don't mind dying in the process. Of course, I'll avoid that from happening, but if that happens, so be it. So he went there and understand that there's no way he can talk about Dharma like this if they don't solve two problems. Food, shelter, food, medicine, all right? So he's very practical as well. He's not, he's not stuck in that. It's like, oh, you must believe. He's like, okay, let's solve your problem. Food, farming techniques, improving. So he teach farming. Medicine, when you're sick, how do you treat different ailments, drink what kind of herbs, pick up what kind of um, knowledge, all this medical knowledge he passed on. So he spent years building up the country basically from scratch, spreading the knowledge for free. All right, let them be self-sustaining, able to support themselves. Then he talked about Dharma. And six years on his life, I think six years, he built up the community. That community finally has semblance of human warmth in that. That means care, compassion, no robbery, no robbery, no deceitful behaviors. That's Dharma. All right. It comes in many forms. It can be missionary from other uh, religion, but that's Dharma. That's what missionary does if they do it right. Right. They understand the needs. They give them the needs, and then they build them up and enhance it. I'll wrap this up with ten virtues of preaching. First one is know the Dharma. Of course, know your job description, know what you are talking about. Second one is how to preach. So the first one, know the Dharma, you listen to the Dharma, you know the Dharma. You feel it, you walk the Dharma, you walk through it, you know the Dharma. Second one is how to preach. You know it, right? Some people are very good at doing things, but when they explain what they're doing, it's an entire different skill set, right? That's why you know, what makes a person a technician to a manager or to a successful business owner. They can sell what they know properly. Yes, it's a salesman job in a sense, but without asking for anything in return. The job itself is rewarding for them. So how to preach is important. How do you explain a dish of tofu in a such luxurious, in such a way that they wanted to pay $10,000 there? See, I'm talking about real life now. So you say, it's just a tofu with soy sauce. No, the soy sauce is sourced from the highest mountains. All right, in Zhongnan Shan, all right, it was sourced and the cultivation was met. Uh, technique was done by thousands of years of of of, of this um, knowledge, and it was grinded down to the finest bits, and then it was bottled in the highest ISO certified. So something like that, okay, and then it was poor in that way. The tofu is beautiful. The soybean was cultivated non-GMO, all right, in the farmlands of um, northeast China. Something like that. It was shipped in the most pristine way. So anyway, sell it. So how do you sell the Dharma properly? All right. Look at the examples. Master Ching Kong, Master um, Cheng De, uh, Master Wu Xing. They sell it different, different audience. Know your audience. This is actually taught by Master Ching Kong's. I think this is important because it, you can use it in your life. Like Master Ching Kong's teacher, Mr. Li, right? Li Bing Nan Lao Jisu. He also teach him how do you teach the Dharma. You need to understand your audience. You need to understand um, some, if especially when you, when you have an audience of different levels of education background, right? You can't just go all wordy and technical. What if it's auntie and uncles that you know they are they are not how to say they are not used to this wordiness. Also, in modern time, we don't really like wordy jumbo. We like something simple, still elegant, but something presentable, presented simply. Right. Sim simplicity is the best form. So they, they want, they you need to find a way to say it using simple words, but allowing them space to expand on it. So you need to, this is a skill in preaching and this does not happen without practicing. And some people are born, give off the gap, but like Venerable Panaki practice, he, of course he has a gift. And that's why some people are picked to talk about Dharma, like Master Ching Kong, because he is very good at 
changing the use the narrative and suit the situation. Right? When he goes to the Zen Buddhist temple, talk about the Dharma, he don't talk about pure land, he talk about Zen. He talk about how Zen this um this venerable in charge of this place helps. You know, he always attributes the credit to them. So it causes harmony in the organization. But he's not a Huato, you know, so to speak. He's not like, oh I, I changed my principle when I work. He he stick to his point. That's why he kind of caused a lot of people to criticize him because he's talk the truth. But the way he deals with every scenario is always with kindness and wisdom. And that's something we need to have. Master Chen De as well, he knows how to say things that suits the club audience. Like when you come to here, he talks about Sydney. He talks about uh, what we've been. He talks about how Bankstown Temple does not come easily. How long it takes to get to this stage today. So he understands this, he talks to us. When he talks to us, you realize that he trying to understand what we going through. So this is another skill of a preacher. You need to understand your audience and then you know what to sell, what to pitch. Number three, fearless with public. You cannot be like shaking while you're talking. You can have nerves strike, but you still need to maintain your composure when you're talking to them. So you have stage fright. It's normal. Best performers have stage fright. I went through the acting school. Everyone has stage fright. Everyone has that. Even the best performers, you know, uh, like what? Of course, God, what square did I go? Um, anyway, um, so they did need to be unfear. I mean, they need to overcome the fear. And then four, you have to debate, debate, debate. You have to debate. Yeah, you have to debate. People find trouble with you, not find trouble. People actually have points they have, and their points are legit as well. You need to understand where their point come from, and then you need to able to articulate properly what the Dharma is. So solve the misunderstanding. Like if all is emptiness, why are we still here? Like if all is emptiness, they mean that we all become a monk and go to the mountain and not doing anything. So aren't we a parasite of the society? Yeah, they'll ask you, right? Like you all receive the offerings from the, from the lay Buddhists. So what, what contribution do you have? So do you feel sad sometimes? Do you feel in need of uh, Dharma sometimes. I mean, do you feel in need of consolation sometimes? All right. Do you feel like something that speaks to you helps you to go through the difficult times? Yeah. This is what Dharma is. So you need to sell that. And then you have tactful preaching. You can't just say, like we mentioned last week, you can't just say something about death too bluntly when you're invited to an event of, you know, baby shower, you know, when they just have a first month of birth and say, oh, death is inevitable. You know, life and death. You know, when there's life, there's death. And then everyone was like, bro, like, I'm just inviting you to give us wishes and uh, maybe, you know, some good terms. You don't have to go that deep. I know that I'm a Buddhist. I respect that, but no, not the right time. Timing, all right? Timing. Uh, same goes, you don't go to the people's funeral and then talk about, oh, yeah, I mean, by the way, they talk about, you know, festivals and yeah. Anyway, obey the Dharma. You are propagating the law, lawyer, right? Lawyer obey the law. Well, I don't know how many lawyers break the law. Uh, who knows? Or loopholes. Like in this case, literally do not allow um, corruption to happen. Like you have to follow the rules. Processing dignity. You need to carry yourself properly. You're representing the Dharma wheel. You're representing the Dharma wheel in real life, representing your company. If you're leading a team, you're representing your team. That's a brand you carry on. Your name is a brand. Your face is a brand to this. Same goes for here. All the venerable, why do they have to do all these rituals and all that? It's not because of themselves. It's to build confidence and brand to the world. This is Pure Land Learning Association. Or this is Pure Land Association. And this is how they conduct themselves. I am a Buddhist. This is how I conduct myself. I can be strict. I can be relaxed. This is the brand I'm preaching. So when they look at you, they think of the Dharma. So you have to carry yourself with dignity. Zealous progress. You must always push forward no matter what happens. You have that fervor, that, that hunger, that, that, that wants to do it, to, to give them, to give, and then not just give, to give more than they asked for, to give more than they expected. That level of fervor is needed because in replace, because when you saw all this, right, like 
in, art, in other contexts, people in artist industry, they pay very low, right? Like in Japan, they draw manga, but they pay very minimum wage. They survive just by eating the fast, the what, quick instant noodles and living on a very cheap rental room for 20, 10 years, 20 years. Not everyone can be famous like, you know, I forgot his name, the house castle, moving castle. Um, but they still continue because they have that fervor. Same goes for Buddhism. This one is even more. You don't have money, of course. You only get by with the offerings of the people. And if you go into a poor area, you don't have much offerings. Supplies have to wait months to come because there are shipments from maybe wealthier country, Australia, Taiwan, China. Those takes time. You are there, you need to find a way to solve the problem of the people there. You need to really carry yourself forward just purely by, by that will. Right? I, I, I'm here, I'm dying with these people here. I'm staying with them here. Right? I'll sink with them if it doesn't work. So that level of zealous, tirelessness. People ask you 10, question, 10 times the same question from all around the world. What's the chinko? Everyone asks him again and again. He has to repeat again and again. He repeat that for 60 years. So tirelessness. Power in success. That I still have to understand fully, but maybe because he wants to, maybe he really wants to achieve that goal um, in mind. Like, I'll leave it for your thoughts. <laughs> what do you guys think power in success means? It's 12.10, 20 minutes before food. All right, any reflection, guys? I'll wrap it up there. <laughs> it's a long one. Sorry for uh, lateness. Um, it's been out an hour. How's your life so far? 